The good morning. Question for you this morning. Have you ever met anyone, or maybe you are someone, that knows a whole lot of information about something that is not important? <laughs> Anybody guilty? Um, there's a term we use for this, useless trivia. You ever say that? You know, you, uh, I have the, the, the gift of useless trivia when it comes to, of all things, pop music from the 1980s. When I was in middle school, when I was in high school, I, the songs come on the radio, I can tell you embarrassingly often who's singing this song, what the name of the album was, sometimes what the album cover looked like, what year it came out, and I know most of the lyrics. Um, it's so bad that a lot of times when we're driving as a family and a song comes on the radio like an 80s song, I will say to my family, I will give anyone in the car $100 if they can tell me who's singing this song. And I, I do this because I know they don't know. And it makes me feel somehow good to be able to, to be the guy that knows this useless information. My kids, who are obviously not nearly old enough to know this stuff, almost always say, I don't know Michael Jackson. You know, it was like, no, good guess. He had lots of hits. But my wife, who is my age by, I'm, I'm a year and a half older, but we grew up in the same era. She doesn't have this useless trivia, so I'll say $100. You know this song. She knows it. She can sing along and hum along, but she never knows who it was. So I have yet to ever have to pay anybody $100. And I tell my wife, it's kind of funny, because I... I, I Try not to be a, too much of a know-it-all about this. I'll tell her, look, be glad you don't know these artists because the only reason I know is because I had no social life <laughs> in the 1980s. And this is true. I only know this because I sat in my room and listened to music and read the little notes on the, the cassette back in those days, right? It's not anything to be proud of. It is a sign that I was socially awkward, um, and here is the, the reality. My knowledge of this music from, from, you know, my childhood is truly trivia. In the, the literal sense of that word, it is trivial, right? It, it doesn't matter. It's, when we say something's trivial, we mean it's unimportant or just something that has very little value. And that falls squarely into that category. Now, I hope I'm not the only one that has these realms of knowledge that are trivial. They're unimportant. They're not valuable, not useful, uh, because I don't want to be the only loser, you know, in the, in the room. <laughs> and I thought about this as, as I was reading in Amos. We're, we're, we're doing a study of this book in the Old Testament, Amos. Amos was a prophet who basically was sent to warn Israel that uh, downfall was coming for the nation. And today we're going to turn to this book of Amos to confront the danger of wasting too much of our lives on trivial things. This is a risk, isn't it? It is a very real risk for us to look back and think, I, I devoted far too much of my life to things that ultimately were not very important, that ultimately weren't valuable. Have any of you, maybe a little bit older, had some of these painful moments? Uh, it's interesting. My dad was wonderful. He lived to be 89. And I noticed a shift in my dad uh, as he got into his older years. Uh, a softening. Some of the things that growing up were things he, he, he harped on a lot. Responsibility, hard work. These, uh, those are important things. But in his older age, I remember once my wife had a job and she was having a hard time at work. And my dad said something that shocked me because it didn't sound like my dad. He said, Lori, he said, maybe just get another job. Life's too short to, to have a job you don't enjoy. It's like, that doesn't sound like my dad. My dad was always just, you know, just muscle through, you know, man up, do it. Do you, and life's not always fair. Life's not always fun. You just have to do all this stuff. But I think he realized that there were some things in life that were important. And he had not always in the past recognized the value of those. He had come to the point, point where he realized that, hey, happiness in your life is sometimes more important than, than the steady paycheck or not taking the risk or something like that. Um, 
as I was thinking about this idea of, of spending our lives on things that aren't that important, that really aren't that valuable, I read an article uh, that said that the average adult spends, now this was adults, people over the age of 18, spend about three hours a day on their cell phones. It said the average adult checks their phone 344 times a day. Isn't that amazing? Now, let me tell you this, for kids, for people under 18, that number is going to be a lot higher. Surely, the amount of time spent and the number of times they check their phone, I can tell you this because my kids run out of data every month and I don't, right? Um, if you have teenagers, you know this. Uh, and, and wow, there is a very real risk in, in, in our culture, and there has always been, of pursuing trivial things. And today we're going to turn to Amos and hopefully be confronted and challenged and encouraged to spend our lives on things that matter, things that aren't trivial, things that really are valuable, that really are important. So if you have a Bible and would like to turn there, we're going to be in Amos chapter 6 to look at the danger of trivial pursuits, as we will call them. I don't know. I think we had some technical issues. Eric Purser's not here. You'll have to tell him, Eric, we missed you because without you, we couldn't even get the scriptures up. But we do have the Bibles in the the pews. You can use one of those. Amos chapter 6. We're going to read the whole chapter beginning in verse 1. This is God's word. Let us listen. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. The notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Calme and see. And from there go to Hamath the Great. And then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? O you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and, like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. That's the symbol for the nation of Israel. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile. And the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds. And I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. And if ten remain in one house, they shall die. And when one's relative, the one who anoints him for the burial, shall take him up to bring his bones out of the house and shall say to him who is in the innermost parts of the house, is there anyone still with you? He shall say no. And he shall say silence. We must not mention the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord commands that the great house shall be struck down into fragments and the little house into bits. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice in Lodabar and say, have we not by our own strength captured Carnaim for ourselves? For behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall oppress you from Labo Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. That's one of those chapters where I assume you all understood everything, right? Any any time there are names of places that we don't know, it's it's immediately easy to understand. We'll see if we can dig into this a little bit. This is a a lament passage. You all know what that word means, passage of mourning. It begins, as we've already had several of Amos' messages, begin with this lament, woe. He says, woe to you who feel safe 
and successful and secure while all the while you're heading for disaster and you don't even know it. Chapter 6 is kind of unique in the book of Amos. Uh, we've talked in the past weeks, if you weren't with us, uh, Amos was, was a prophet sent at a time when Israel, which had been a unified nation, had split. They'd had, it, in a sense, a bit of a civil war. And there was now a, a kingdom to the north called typically Israel and a kingdom to the south called Judah. They were kinsfolks, kinsmen, but they had, had disagreed and had, had a, a split in the nation. And Amos was primarily prophesying to the northern kingdom, Israel, because they were the, the worst, right? The nation as a whole was, was wandering from the Lord, was losing faithfulness. But the northern kingdom of, of Israel was by far worse than Judah at this point. Judah was a little bit behind. They had some good kings. Israel just had one bad after another. But in this passage, Amos even mentions... Judah to the south. He says, woe to those at ease in Zion. That's in Judah. So he's not just warning the ones who are near the edge of the cliff. He's even warning the ones whose demise is coming, but it's going to come a little bit later because they're sort of hanging on to their faith a little bit more uh, as they go. But he says, woe to those at ease in Zion and woe to those who feel secure there in Samaria. Samaria was the capital of that rebellious northern kingdom. Their leaders had a, a great sense of pride. If you were to have surveyed them, the rulers of Israel, then they would have believed themselves to be the, the greatest nation on earth, the strongest of all the surrounding people. Uh, they, they loved the admiration of their people and their national pride, all of this stuff. We, we kind of know that feeling, don't we? We live in America. It's a great nation. We're very blessed to live here. I shared last Sunday that our missionaries who serve in Taiwan, they, they were here a couple of weeks ago and said, look, if you ever get, get discouraged living in America, they said, go live in another country for two or three weeks and come back and you'll be grateful for the blessings you have. But we know that. We live in a land that we oftentimes refer to America as the greatest nation on earth, don't we? We have a sense of pride. Well, kind of like our nation, uh, Israel at that time was militarily very strong. They were geographically very large. They, were, they were, had expanded their region. There was a lot of prosperity, a lot of money, a lot of wealth, a lot of success in the nation. But as we have seen, as we've studied this book, all the while when a lot of these external things seemed, by all measures, things seemed to be going great, there was a really big problem. And that was a, a spiritual problem. At the root of this nation that were called to be God's people, spiritually, they were decaying rapidly. We've seen it in different ways. There was a lot of injustice that went on in the land. It was both promoted and tolerated. Dishonesty, bribery, uh, a disregard for people that were the poor and the needy, an unwillingness and an unlove, uh, unlovingness towards those and their neighbors. Um, profiteering, just money was the, 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 the driving force. People just wanted more money uh, and idolatry, empty religion. They went through the motions of religion but really had no real knowledge of God. Uh, lots of problems. And here is the thing we need to notice, that because so many things seem to be going well, the Israelites could not see and they were ignoring some really big problems. You, you, you think that ever happens with us? Things are going well. We're comfortable. There's some, some major problems, but we just ignore them. I think we can, I think we can identify them. They suffered from what one commentary I was studying said was the problems of affluence and complacency. And listen, sometimes those things go together, don't they? Right? The more we have, the more affluent we become, the more we have all of our needs met and all excess more than we need, the more complacent we get. And sometimes it is when things seem really good that we feel like we don't need anything or anyone, and sometimes that even means God, right? Uh, I've heard it said many times in my life that the, the greatest spiritual challenges don't happen when things are bad, the real spiritual challenge happens when things are going really well. And that's when you, the test is, do I really need God or not? My dad, who I mentioned earlier, I love my dad, he used to say from time to time, there, there, are no, there are no atheists in foxholes, right? 
It's very easy to see your need for God and to call out to Him when your life is at risk and things are, there's a great danger all around you, right? It's your, when you're desperate, it's easy to turn to God in faith. But uh, we look at a, a world like ours today, right? We, we are living in a time where, like my generation, was really two generations. My parents were older when I was born. They were two generations uh, ahead of me. And those generations, my dad was born in the 20s in the Depression, right? They, growing up, they were dirt poor. And so what happens, that generation says, well, I want my kids to have a better life than I had. And then that generation says, well, I want my kids to have more than I had. And eventually, we end up with generations that have had everything, have had it super easy. And do we find that that makes us spiritually healthier? I don't think so. There's a reason, there are a lot of reasons why there are more people in the United States today that identify as atheists or agnostic or not religious than there has been in the history of our country, right? Prosperity, affluence has bred complacency, and it is a problem. We have a lot of people in our world today, you have a lot of friends, you have a lot of family members, a lot of relatives who see no need for God. We see an increasing mockery of people that, that have faith. They get mocked by the people around them. They're oftentimes even called evil for believing in God. Uh, or we see that oftentimes religion becomes very superficial. So the gospel, uh, instead of being that, that sin is our greatest need, forgiveness of our sins, church just becomes about God wanting you to have your best life, right? Right? So maybe, maybe your religion is you go to church and you hear a message and, you, and it's just to, so you can be told and reminded once again, God wants you to have all of the things you want, right? That's not what Amos was written for, is it? That's why I like to go to these books of the Bible and preach through the whole thing because it forces us to actually see what does God say, right? The message of the Bible is not God just wants to make sure that you are always comfortable, happy, well-fed, all of your desires fulfilled, right? There's something more important in life than that. So, God says to the Israelites, He says, take a look around you. You, you think everything's fine. You think you're safe. You're secure. You're strong. You don't need me. You don't need anybody. He says, take a look around. Look at, He mentions some of the cities around the nation of Israel. He says, look at Kalna. That was a Mesopotamian city. Look at Hamath, a city in a region of Syria, one of their neighboring regions. Look at Gath. It was a Philistine nation. Do you know, if you've ever read the Bible, the Philistines were oftentimes the enemies of the Israelites. He says, are you bigger and better than all of those cities? He says, no, you're not. You think you're invincible. But what you're doing is you are just putting, you're just, uh, putting aside, putting away the day of disaster. What he means is, what, what Amos is saying is, all you're doing is ignoring the fact that things are not good and God's going to deal with it, right? But you're so complacent and so affluent, you don't see any need. You're just, just you don't want to hear about it. You're just saying, oh, no, that will never happen, right? Our nation could never fall. We're too strong. We're too great. Some people have said that those other nations, the Kalne and the Hamath and Gath, that those were nations that had been great and fallen. But that, I don't think that's true. At this point, those nations, I believe those were nations that actually posed a risk to Israel. They were nations that were prepared for battle, while meanwhile Israel thought everything was safe. We'll never have any problems at all. And God was again calling them out on their complacency. Well, why did they feel so safe and complacent? Quite simply, because they had it so good. Uh, we read these things. Amos says, you all lie on your fancy beds made out of ivory. That was a luxury. He says, you, you lounge around on your cushy couches. You eat the best foods. You, you pick the best lambs. You, you make the best steaks, right? You, you eat the choicest cuts of meat. Uh, you sing and you party and you drink all night. You don't even drink your wine out of goblets. You drink it out of bowls. You're so, so, your excesses are so big. You have the most expensive perfumes, right? Uh, basically, Amos is saying you all are living the good life, the life of ease and comfort and plenty. But, notice here is the but in this passage. But you are not grieved over the ruin of your nation the nation of, of Israel. 
See, what's happening is the nation is, is really rotting away spiritually, internally. But they don't care. They don't see it. They don't smell it, right? <laughs> they don't smell that rot. And all the while, all they do is they just brag about what Eugene Peterson, in his translation of the message, he says, you brag about your trivial pursuits. Hence the title. I borrowed that from Eugene Peterson there. And God says to these who are ignoring the problems and just enjoying themselves, he says, you will be the first ones to go when I send you into exile. I'm going to give your nation over to your enemies. And those of you with all the money, you, the richest of you, you're going to be the first ones that I send out. See, God is not willing to ignore our spiritual condition. Thank God, right? He does not leave us to ourselves leave us to our own devices. He cares about what's important. We would be very content to live our lives only caring about how we look, how we smell. You know, I think it's so funny. He talked about they, they have these fancy oils that they anoint themselves with. Yes, and we can go and spend, you know, 60 bucks on a bottle of cologne to make myself smell good. That's not really that important, is it? I can smell great and be a horrible person. And I'm sure I've been in that position many times. But they only cared about what was on the outside. God was not going to ignore what was going on the inside. So let me, let me tell us today and remind us, God cares about the state of our character. God cares about the state of our spirit. God cares about the, the state of our thinking and our minds and what we do, how we use our resources, how we use our lives that he has given us. And God will bring us around to deal with what's important. Even if we try to devote our lives to these trivial pursuits, God will continue to work on his people to help us live into those things that matter, right? But we have to cooperate. And so God promises that he's going to do this with, with Israel. And it's kind of frightening. The Lord God has sworn by himself. In other words, God says, I am making an oath today on my own name that I abhor the pride of my people, Jacob, that I hate your strongholds, your cities, and your, your strengths. I hate that. And I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. That's God's promise. That's kind of frightening, is it? God says, I'm making an oath today with you. I'm making a promise. I will deliver you, my complacent, affluent people, over to their enemies. God goes on to say through Amos that it would be so bad in that day. And, and this is what happened in 722, the, a nation called the Assyrians, they came and conquered Israel. God kept his oath, right? And you can be sure if God makes a promise, he will be faithful. He will keep it. And, and it happened. And God said, it's going to be so bad that if there are 10 men in one house on that day of disaster, all 10 will die. And if it just so happens that there's a survivor, when they go around to gather the bones of the dead, they'll say, is there anyone here with you that survived? And they will say, no, and be quiet. Don't even say the name of the Lord. You know what I think that is? I think that is a, a picture of people who have felt God's his, his discipline, and, and it was so terrible they don't want him to come back, right? They're frightened. If you, if you say his name out loud, you're, you're just inviting God to come back, and hasn't he already done enough, right? in a sense, is what I believe that is saying. But listen, God is faithful to his promises, both the ones we like and the ones that we may find a bit more challenging. And so God, through Amos, is telling these Israelites, look, it is time to wake up. It is time to get serious. This time of foolishness and trivial pursuits is coming to an end. I will not tolerate it. Amos asks them some questions. Do you race your horses on rocky, uneven ground? Of course not. Do you take your oxen out to plow stony fields where you know it's just full of rocks? Of course not. Only a fool would do something like that. But you are fools, Israel, for thinking you can pervert God's justice. You can forsake God's righteousness as if none of that matters. Don't be foolish. In your pride, God says, you have rejected me. And, and isn't it interesting Here's one of the side effects. If we have all we need, we've got plenty of money in the bank, 
plenty of food on the table, nice car, nice house, all these things that we think are important. What is the end result of that? Pride, right? I, I accomplished this. I did this. I worked hard for this. And God says, in your pride, you've rejected me. You've said, have we not by our own strength captured a carnaum, our enemy for ourselves? And God says, look, I'll show you by whose strength everything happens, by whose strength you live and breathe. And I'll do that by raising up a nation against you, O house of Israel. And he basically says, they will oppress you from the, the northernmost part of your bound border all the way to the south. He said, the disaster is going to be complete. They're going to take everything. So let's pause for a moment and think about this. Uh, are we guilty of trivial pursuits in our lives? Are we guilty of ever becoming complacent because we have so much? Anybody? I, I would say yes. We are a blessed people. We are, by the standards, if you compare us to the rest of the world, rich, right? Right? But do we devote ourselves to feeding the poor, clothing the needy, taking care of our neighbors around us? No. What do we do? We spend three hours a day on our phones. We check our phones 350 times a day. Just, you know. um, I think we directly, in some ways, are kind of like the Israelites. We have so much, but oftentimes I think we do so little. Because we just, we don't really care. We, we're not devoted to the things that are that important, if we're going to be honest. And I think indirectly we do this too. We're guilty in some ways indirectly. You know, we live in a culture where we are obsessed with success, aren't we? And well, who do we idolize? Who do we listen to? Celebrities, right? There is no reason that I, I ought to care what Bruce Springsteen thinks about politics, Right? But, but who, who gets all of the likes? Who do we read? Who do we follow on Twitter, right? Famous people. Well, surely he's famous. He's super rich. He sold a lot of records. He writes good songs, right? So that's the person I want to follow. Right? We don't necessarily look for people that are smart or competent or anything else. I'm not saying Bruce Springsteen's not smart. He might not be. I don't know. I don't know the guy. But we idolize success. We idolize celebrities. We watch Real Housewives. Do we watch them for their wisdom? No, but those are the shows that are famous, right? We covet all the material stuff. And listen, Christians do it too. Churches are the same way. I, I will, I'm not trying to beat up on, on our own denomination, but I went to an evangelism conference a few years ago at the Georgia Baptist Convention had. I love the Georgia Baptist. I'm glad to be Baptist. But... It was basically a two days of getting the pastors of the biggest churches around to come and preach, right? Well, it, is, is it only churches that have thousands of people in big cities that are doing the work of the kingdom, right? Of course not. I know faithful pastors in Catoosa of small churches who lead people to Christ, right, who are effective in evangelism. But those aren't the ones we put in the pulpit at our big meetings. We put the successful, right, Mega church pastors. It happens in the, in the Christian community. And meanwhile, Amos says, look, God does not like pride. In fact, God abhors. He hates our pride. And God does not like our so-called strongholds. Oftentimes, see, strongholds, a lot of times we think they're blessings, don't we? The strongholds were their big fortified cities. And God says, I hate your strongholds. You've got your trust and your confidence in those things. But I'm sure the Israelites said, look how blessed we are to have these wonderful big fortified city walls, right? I think we do this a lot. We, we say, this is a blessing. I've been so blessed. I've got this and this. Sometimes I wonder if we might be better off without all these blessings. And I say this of myself also. Sometimes I wonder, might I spiritually care about the things that matter if I didn't have so much excess with which to pursue trivial things that don't matter at all. So, I want to ask a question today as we, as we kind of wrap this up. I'm asking you, I want you to think about this. I don't want you to answer it right now because it requires some thought. But listen, what is important to you? What is really important in life? 
What ought to be important to you and to me? Do you ever think about this? Do you ever stop to say, God, what really matters in life? Sometimes it takes tragedies to get us to do that, doesn't it? But I think we ought to pause. And I, I want to suggest a few things. These are just a few principles. I want to suggest to you that we need to remember people are more important than possessions. Most of us pursue possessions. Most of us, when we think, what is it I want in life? What's the next thing I'm hoping to accomplish? I don't, it's not usually bettering my relationship with so-and-so, right? Getting to know the neighbors that I don't know. It's oftentimes material things. But it is very clear to us that in God's economy, people matter far more than possessions. We need to relearn this in our priority system. I want to tell you something else. Re- excuse me. Reconciliation is more important than recreation. Okay? God says that if you're a Christian, you are a, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You have been put here to share with other people the good news that Jesus gave his life so that people could be reconciled to God. Right? That's our calling as Christians, not just a pastor, not just evangelists, not just preachers. Every Christian is an ambassador for Christ. And, and Paul is very clear about this. Your job is to appeal to other people, be reconciled to God. He has made you agents of reconciliation. He's made all of us ministers of the good news. But we spend so much of our time not on reconciliation, but recreation, having fun, sports, Sports for our kids, sports for ourselves, movies, you name it. I'm not saying any of those are bad in and of themselves. But if you looked at your time and your resources and your money, could you say, I am pursuing things that are trivial at a pace that does not make sense? Guilty. Uh, I want to suggest to us this morning that fighting for our responsibilities is really more important than fighting for our rights all the time. Right? Right? We live in a culture that the highest good is you claiming your right to do something, right? But with very little emphasis on your responsibility to anyone else. I think that the Bible actually teaches us that Jesus, when he saves us and he fills us with his Holy Spirit, he sets us free from selfishness where I only live thinking about me and what do, am I entitled to, to where I can become someone that serves others. And so it's not about me, it's about you. I'm willing to forsake my rights to help you because I have a responsibility to love you, to minister to you, to help you, right? It's a shift in our priorities. Let me suggest that what's really important in life, one thing is self-control, which is more important than self-expression. Listen, our culture says this, the greatest good is you being your true self. Well, that is... May be true, but only if your true self has been saved and renewed in the image of Jesus Christ. If my true self is just a really super lost, confused, messed up person, which I, I'm Lord's working on me, then I don't know that expressing that more clearly is the greatest good in life, right? What the Bible teaches is the good news is this. When, when you put your trust in Jesus and he, he gives you his Holy Spirit, he helps you to become a person that now doesn't just live to express themselves, but lives with self-control. And it's kind of a, it's ironic because it's really not self-control. It's the Spirit, right, giving us the ability to do something we couldn't do. But the writers of the Bible say the fruit of the Spirit includes this self-control. But do you kind of see how we're fighting against fighting against the current here the world the enemy all says here's what it's all about self-expression your rights recreation and material success and possessions meanwhile i think the gospel says no it's all about self-control so that you become a responsible follower of jesus christ who really cares about seeing other people reconciled to jesus and being saved and who cares more about people than possessions and wealth right totally different So I want to close with this. I want to leave you with a few thoughts, and maybe you can continue to think about these as you you go. Sometimes people will ask me as a pastor, you know, what's sort of your philosophy of ministry? What's your your plan for the church or something like that? And I I say, well, it's it's pretty simple. Uh, I think there are three things that churches really have to be about, and I think there are three things Christians can use this as your life plan. What am I going to be about? What's important? 
in my life? Well, in the Bible, there's something we call the great commandment. You remember this? Jesus was asked once, they said, teacher, what is the most important commandment in the whole of the, the law of Moses? And Jesus, you can go to Matthew 22 if you want to read this. He said, the most important commandment is this, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. He said, this is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is the great commandment. What's my philosophy of ministry? Fulfill the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart more than anything else, and love your neighbor as yourself. Then there's something we call the great commission, isn't there? What is my philosophy of ministry? What are churches supposed to do? Well, I say we're supposed to do discipleship and evangelism, right? Jesus, in Matthew 28, is the last thing he said at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. He said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. In other words, tell people, do the reconciliation work that I'm sending you to do. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. What's important in life? That is this great commission. As you go and you love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, as you go and I'm telling you love your neighbor more than you love possessions, treat people as more important, do this. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Bring them to faith, bring them to salvation, and then teach one another to obey all I've commanded. Grow as my disciples. And the third thing is one we don't talk about a lot, but there's the great commandment. There is a great commission. And there's something that sometimes we call the great requirement. This goes back to the Old Testament in the book of Micah. And in Micah chapter 6, the prophet Micah says this, God has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. What does God require of you? Listen, I think there's a reason God has given us this great commandment, this great commission, and this reminder of this great requirement for his people. These are the things that matter. These are the things that are important. Everything else, in all honesty, is trivial pursuit, right? We need need to get about the business God has given us to do. Let's have the courage to ask God to help us to do that today. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, it is painful to preach Amos because, Lord, number one, I know that this stuff isn't fun to hear. And, Lord, I know it isn't fun for me to hear. But, Lord... We realize today that fun is not the greatest virtue. But Lord, there are more important things than our comfort, our comfort in our possessions, our comfort in the messages from the Bible, whatever it might be. But God, there are truly important matters at hand. And Lord, they are matters of not just life and death, but eternal significance. And yet, Lord, here we are, three hours a day checking our phones, hundreds of times. Lord, pursuing things that just don't matter. God, forgive us. Lord, if there is anyone else today convicted by this message from Amos, I pray we would join together and confess and repent and say, God, we're sorry. We're sorry, God, that we have placed possessions over people and recreation over reconciliation Lord, all of these things. And Father, as, as we confess, uh, we also confess that, God, it, it might even be hard for us to imagine changing because some of this is so ingrained, it's just a reflex. We don't even think about it. We wouldn't know how to change it. But God, today, we are coming to you because we believe in your power. We believe in the gospel that says that we can be born again. We can become new creatures. We can change Father, we need to, but we need your help to do it. So today we ask, Lord, that you, as we leave, will continue to to confront us, God, about our trivial pursuits. That, God, you will continue to confront us about wasting our time and our energy on 80s music and things that don't matter, things that aren't important, that don't have value. Lord, I pray that we will, of course, uh, go and realize that you have created us to have joy But, Father, that joy would be found, Lord, more and more in things that really matter, things that should give us joy, loving our neighbor, sharing the gospel, growing as disciples of Jesus Christ. 
walking humbly before you, loving kindness and justice and mercy. Father, this is a big ask. We need your help. Father, we thank you today that you're more committed to this than we are, that, Lord, really it begins and ends with you. And we thank you today for the gospel, that, Lord, you so loved us before we ever cared about anything important, Father, to send your Son, Jesus Christ, that Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. And, Lord, Jesus came to call us to a life of far greater significance than any we would pursue on our own. Lord, we thank you today that unlike Israel, we've heard the gospel. Lord, they did not yet know that you would send your son and he would die on the cross for their sins and ours. Lord, we thank you that Jesus took all of the punishment, all of the wrath that we deserve when he gave his life on that cross. And Lord, that anyone, anyone, no matter who we are, where we've been, where we come from, what we're doing right now, then anyone that calls upon the name of Jesus Christ who gave himself shall be saved. Father, I pray if there is someone here today that is not a Christian, has not made a commitment of faith in Jesus Christ, that they will believe today, that they will confess their sin and their need for the forgiveness that Jesus gave on the cross, and that they will say, Jesus, I believe in you. I trust in you. Thank you for dying for my sins. Be my Lord and my Savior. I give my heart to you. Come into my life and make me a new person. And Lord, I pray that someone today will be saved. And Lord, for those of us who've made that decision, I pray today, Lord, you will continue to make us new people. And Lord, that you will make us people who do not pursue trivial things, but those things that really matter. Help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.